<clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, if you could just turn to your neighbors and show your liveliness and say hello to uh, people next to you. Would you do that? Yeah. You can make some sound. It's okay. If you could just look at the title, um, the title is very uh, informative, usually is. I try to pick a title that's kind of like uh, gateway, as the gateway to the message. So if you could just look at the title, we are not children of slaves, but dot, 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 okay? We are not children of slaves. Um, Meaning, we're not born through a slave. If you're born through a slave, you are a slave. Does that make sense? If you're born through a free woman or legitimate wife, you become a child. You become a son or daughter. But if you are born through a slave, you are a slave. We've been talking about slavery. And uh, the truth is, the gospel truth is, if you're not in faith, you're in slavery right now. You are. That's not, you know, my statement, but that's the statement from the scripture. And we call scripture the truth. And truth cannot be a lie, can it? Do you think with me? Truth cannot be a lie. You're a, you're a slave. You're a slave to as simple as drugs, marijuana, sex, things of this world, as deep as your own love, your selfish love. You're a slave, okay? And uh, just to give you a picture, I just want to give you a picture. Oh. Okay, I know I've been showing you this picture. And uh, I do not, again, I want to clarify, I do not have any disrespect towards certain race or anything like that, but I want to show you this picture just to illustrate. And I ask this question, how many human beings do you see? I see eight, right? Don't you see eight? But obviously one kind of sticks out and seven kind of blends in really well. And the question that I'm asking is, that master presumably he's the master do you think he, that master loves uh, the slaves absolutely not right you leash and chain them and undress them treat them treat people like i don't know animals slavery is dehumanizing you don't live like a human being you don't live like a human being that you are created to be you totally, totally live in the life of slavery. You know, it's kind of interesting because slaves live as slaves not because they want to live as a slave. Slaves live as slaves because they are slaves. It's not like you have an option. Okay, today I'm going to live as a son. Tomorrow I'm going to live as a slave. It doesn't work like that. The spiritual truth is you live as a slave because you are a slave. That's the scriptural truth. Until you come to faith. You know, um, <clears throat> we've been going through this uh, in Galatians. And today, we're finishing up uh, the theology section of chapter 4. Very, very important chapter. Are you guys following? I'm just kind of asking you. Do you guys follow chapter 3 and chapter 4? And I am not belittling you. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I really want you to learn. And I told you <clears throat> from the beginning that some years ago when I was younger, through the Galatians, Christianity was open to me. I'm serious. Through the Galatians, the Christian gospel totally began to make sense. Okay? I'm just giving you this because you could be going to church for years not understanding what Christianity is at all. You just come and do your duties, go through the hoops, 
doing the motion, and really doesn't affect your life. That's slavery. That's slavery. Okay? So, I want to just begin uh, with that uh, introduction. And uh, so we're kind of finishing up the most important section of Galatians Gospel, chapter 4. And this particular section is probably the most important and perhaps the most difficult. But I know it's manageable. Okay, I know it is manageable, and I'll try to make it as uh, palatable as possible for you. I know the uh, Lord wants to uh, help you to understand. Okay, so let me begin. Uh, let me just read the text one more time. <clears throat> Verse 21, again, uh, Paul is explaining the truth of the gospel which is salvation by grace and grace alone. I know you hear this every single week, but you still don't get it. Some of you don't get it. That's why I want to say this. The difference between all the religions and Christianity is all the religion is man's work. You try to go to God. You try to achieve it. You try to earn it. You try to work through it. You do good things, and you do duties, you do certain rituals, and you do certain givings, and you feel, I'm getting closer to God. That's religion. All the religions. Christianity is opposite. Christianity begins with, that's not possible. So, man cannot go to God. Therefore, God came to man. Historically, factually and really just as you're a real person and i'm a real person that's a fact that's a that's a historical fact and that's really that really happened okay he came to us and he did it for us gospel is not asking you to do something gospel is a simple proclamation of this is what god has done for you as you hear it you could receive it or you could reject it I think most people reject it. In history, most people doesn't, doesn't, doesn't blink. Most people laugh at it. Most people, oh, that's ridiculous. Most people inside the church, it doesn't really affect them. But those of God will hear the words of God. Pastor Paul Park read that today. I love that verse. Do you hear it? Those of God will hear the words of God. So, so he's explaining the truth of the gospel again. Now he's closing it up with using, again, the example of Abraham. And he uses Abraham eight times in Galatians. In this short book, 140-some verses, he uh, quote and utilize him as a prototy prototypical example of the gospel of the truth eight times. Pretty important figure. And it goes all the way begin to, uh, back to a, uh, Genesis 11. Okay, so from Abraham to Moses 430 years later, and Jesus 2,000 years later, and then Martin Luther another 1,600 years later, until you and I another 500 years later, God's intention was always the same, saving his people by grace and through faith in Christ alone. It's never your work. It's never your merits. It's never it's your achievement. So he's finally... Uh, Paul is kind of wrapping it up in this theology and the gospel section. And he tried to persuade Galatian Christians who are like his children. Remember we talked about this? I'm going to have to labor again until Christ is foamed in you. Until Christ is embryoed in you. Remember that? How does one cell, zygote, a sperm and an egg fertilized, one zygote, one cell, organism, becomes a full human being. If you just stop and think about that, and if you just be fair to this question, you know that's not human domain. It's mother's labor, mother's going through, uh, you know, for pregnancy, and it's difficult for mothers. Yes, I appreciate that, but how does one cell 
began to sell divide. I don't even know how many times. I tried to Google that. I couldn't find it. If you could tell me, you know, medical doctors. How many times? By the time it becomes something called embryo, look like a human being. You saw the picture of it. You could, if you Google it, you'll see the picture of it. And I did not want to bring this up, but do you think that's a human being or not a human being? Eight weeks. Okay, that's not what I want to bring it up. But do you think that's a human being or not a human being? If you just leave it alone, it becomes you. Right? So how does that cell division becomes a human being? Where is that engineering and the power coming from? How does cell divide by itself? Does that make any sense? I was a biochemistry major uh, when I was in college. And human DNA, uh, I forgot those na their names, but really made me realize this cannot be happening by chance. There is no way. There is just no way. There's got to be a power and someone who is greater than this design and is pursuing it. Okay, so think about that. And life is being embryoed in you until you are born again. Could you picture that? You may be into 30 weeks pregnancy. You may be into 10 weeks pregnancy, first trimester, second trimester. But one day, Lord willing, you'll be birthed. Can I just begin with this statement? In Christianity, if I were to sum, sum it up, if you are born twice, you will die once. But if you're only born once, you're going to die twice. I'm going to explain, okay? Everyone is birthed, every single one of you. But if you're born again of God, you're only going to die once. One physical death, because Christ, eternal life, lives in you, and you will never going to die eternally, uh, spiritually. You're born twice, you'll die once. However, if you're just born once, and you're going to die physically, and then die at the final judgment eternally. Does that make sense? That's Christianity, simply put. Okay, let, let's begin. So, using Abraham's example, tell me who you desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? He's saying, are you kidding me? You want to go back to that slavery? Don't you know what the law says? Don't you know what law does that to you? Law condemns you. There is no way you'll be able to obey all of it, let alone all of it, but any of it. So, therefore, you will be guilty that you realize that you are a transgressor, that you will be responsible before the judgment of God. And you know it. Every single human being, you know it. That's why we fear death. Fear has to do with punishment, the Bible says. Okay? Are you kidding me? You who desire to be under the law again, do you not listen to the law? For it is written, using the uh, historical, biblical example of Abraham again, it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by slave woman, Hagar, and one by free woman, Sarah. But the son of the slave was born, that's Ishmael, according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman, Isaac, was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants, allegory or analogy. I think it's better better. Uh, a better term for you to understand. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, which is the law through Moses, being children for slavery. In other words, law will make you slave. You will, law will make you realize that you are a slave because you are not able to obey any of it. She is Hagar, the a slave woman. So in other words, you, if you are born through the slave, you are a slave. But however, the Hagar is a Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem. 
the religious establishment, Judaism, and all these religious people. The, by the way, religious people are not in just the New Testament, but it's in the Old Testament, New Testament, and present church. Religious people are inside the church. Okay? So, now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in the slavery with her children. In other words, mother who is slave only give birth to slaves. Okay? That's what it, it is explaining. But the Jerusalem above, present Jerusalem, and then there is a Jerusalem above or heav heavenly Jerusalem referring to the gospel. Salvation by grace. Instead of Mount Sinai, it is Mount Calvary. Okay? Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, and you who are not in labor. For the children of, uh, of the desolate one will be more than those who, one who has a husband. That's a quotation from Isaiah 51, basically talking about through the gospel, there's going to be millions of children of Abraham, God's people. Okay? So, Verse 28, now you, this is the key statement, you, brothers, are like Isaac and children of promise. Can I just ask you, some of you know the story of Isaac, some of you don't, I, I, I realize that, but when the Bible says you're like Isaac, what kind of child was Isaac? If you could think with me. For those of you who do not know the biblical background, his father was 100 years old. His mother was 90 years old. Okay, I know, I don't know whether man has a menopause, but, you know, Sarah was definitely beyond menopause, and uh, Abraham was as good as dead. So what's the chance of they having a child? Zero times zero. Zero. I say negative, right? But Isaac was birthed because God said he will be birthed. God promised that he will be birthed. So it's not like through the flesh, which is through human means, human wisdom, human idea, but it is God's idea through God's power. Remember we talked about power? How does one cell become you? How, how did that happen? Isaac was born, birthed, because of that power. You know, life is in the domain of God. You know that, right? Human physical life is in the, in the domain of God. Certainly, spiritual life is in the domain of God. In other words, Isaac was birthed because God said he will be birthed. If you are rebirthed, born again, you're sitting here because God said you will be birthed. How many of you decided to be birthed? Oh, it's about time. I can't take this anymore. I need to be birthed. I, I want to pick a beautiful woman so that I'll have a good physical physique. So I'm going to take that woman as, as my, uh, my, my mother. How many of you did that? That's ridiculous, right? You didn't even know. You didn't exist. You were birthed because God said you will be birthed. That's the gospel message. Okay? So... That's what's happening here. So I'm going to explain this story into three parts today. Story of Abraham, who has two wives and two sons. I mean, we're going to look at the biblical, uh, biblical uh, background. Only two verses, 22 and 23. Okay? And then we're going to look at it allegorically or analogy, analogetically. Okay? I don't know whether that's the right word. Okay? Looking at, uh, looking at that for... Uh, verses 24 through 27. And lastly, so what does that mean to us? As we finish up this important section of the Galatians gospel, how, is that, how does that apply to me? Okay, so three, three parts. Let's begin. Uh, the biblical part, only two verses. For it is written, 22, that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael or Isaac. One by a slave woman, who is Hagar, and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. In other words, it was Sarah's impatience. Right? Do you remember this story? Some of you know, some of you don't. Read Genesis. Sarah said, you know, we waited 14 years, uh, you know, Abraham. 
and we have no children. So why don't you take my slave, my servant, and let's have an heir through my servant. It was Sarah's idea. So Sarah was, uh, I mean, excuse me, Hagar was a young servant. And Abraham, like, uh, like okay, I don't mind. You know, and, and they slept and had a child, and that was Ishmael. Human means, human idea, human natural ways. That's what it means, okay? So son of slave was born according to the flesh, flesh, natural ways. But while the son of free woman, Sarah, was born through promise, through supernatural means. 100-year-old father, 90-year-old mother, and yet birthed. Why was he birthed? And how, how was he birthed? Because God promised and God said he would be birthed. Okay? How did that happen physiologically? We have no idea. It was by faith. We're going we're gonna to see this in Hebrews chapter 11. But you see the difference? One is by natural means. The other one is by supernatural means, divine means. If you are alive, spiritually, born again, it's supernatural means. It's God's work. That's the only way you could be born again, so that you are going to have to die once, once, not twice. Okay? So let me give you a, a pertinent historical information. Jews at the time in the first century were very proud of Abraham. They believed that Abraham was a, such a man of faith. He was obedient to the law perfectly, faithfully. That's why he earned the righteousness, which is a lie, completely a lie. But that's what they believed. So, you know, the covenant between God and Abraham and his descendants, because of this uh, covenant or the promise, Jews believed, Jews at the time, Judaism, Judaism, these religious people believe that, believe themselves to be safe because of that covenant eternally and securely. They were banking on their salvation on lies, like so many people right now. I go to church. They're banking on their salvation on lies. Okay? But right up to the development of Judaism and coming of the Lord, that's what they believed. And that's the Judaism and that's what, that was the religious system. But Jesus came. But before Jesus began, John the Baptist came and basically, man, and told them the cold truth. This is what John said in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, to the Jews who are so proud of being a descendant and children of Abraham. We are good. Look at the promise. He's perfect. And we could be like him. And, you know, there's a promise between Abraham and God, and we are good. But to them, John the Baptist says, Do not presume to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Can you imagine that? God could make children of Abraham out of these rocks. You think you're special? God could make God's children out of these rocks. So he proclaimed the cold truth. And then six months later, Jesus came into scene, and he began his ministry. And we talked about John chapter 8. Those of you who never read through John chapter 8 carefully, please read it, read it carefully. Okay, It's an amazing chapter. Remember, Jesus said to the Jews in Jerusalem, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. It's true to you, to you as well. If sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. And the Jews were obviously very, very upset. And they respond to uh, Jesus, we are sons of Abraham. What are you talking about? And have never been a slavery to anyone. Can you imagine that? They were slaves for 400 years. And they say, we were never slaves. Besides, spiritually, they are slaves. And they're just, proclaim, uh, they're just pro protesting to Jesus, to God. We're not slaves. How is it is that you say we will be free? And Jesus said, listen to this. If you are Abraham's children, you will do what Abraham did. Are you Abraham's children? You will do what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? He believed and he obeyed. Are you Abraham's children? 
Okay. And then the Jew responded, well, we have one father, even God. God is our father, and Abraham is our father. And then Jesus answered and just laid down the truth. And he said, if God were your father, you would love me. If you are a rebirth person, you're going to love Jesus. Or else it doesn't affect your life. Loving Jesus is not just coming to church, church once in a while. You know that's different than that, right? I can't go home once in a while and tell my wife, I love my wife. Do you agree? If you are Abraham's children, you will love me. And then he said, you know what? Your father is the devil. Your father is the devil. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 8. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is clearly saying and taught that Abraham's true descendants, in other words, true saved person, is not physical, is not external. It's internal and it's spiritual. Jesus taught that. And in John, uh, Galatians 3.29, we looked at it. If you are Christ's, if you belong to Christ, if you are united with Christ, if Christ lives in you, then you are Abraham's children. Are you Abraham's children? Are you born again? Do you belong to Christ? Or are you an embryo? Are you in second uh, trimester? Or has never happened? Whatever is the case, you're sitting here probably because God, I really believe, is pouring grace upon your life. Even though you may be showing up once in a great while, God brought you here. And you're hearing the word of God, and those of, of God will hear the words of God. Okay? So, today, Paul explains Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. But they had two great differences between Ishmael and Isaac. The first difference is they have the same father, but they have the different mothers. Very big difference. One was a slave, one was real wife. One was a uh, uh, Hagar, and the other one was Sarah. In other words, you have different mothers. Okay? So they had two different mothers. But if you were born of Hagar, you live as a slave. Ishmael was a slave. It was never, he was never the heir of God. Never intended to be. Okay? But if you were born of Sarah then you are a son and you are a daughter. That's the first difference. Same father, but two different mothers. The second difference is, is more interesting, which I already explained. Ishmael was born through the flesh. Natural means, human idea. It was Sarah's impatience. Hey, Abraham, let's have a child through my servant. Okay? And then it was just natural means. Natural physical means. Natural physiological means. However, Isaac was completely different. Isaac was born through the promise. He existed because God said he will exist. You're existing as a man and woman of God because God said you will exist. You know, I was thinking about that this morning. Memorial Day weekend. I don't know what's in your mind right now, but I was meditating on this. We are like Isaac. I'm like Isaac. I exist. And I preach, I live, I have health, I have mind, because God said I exist. I would exist. We're like Isaac. Does that make sense? I hope this makes sense to you. How was Isaac birthed? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, gives a very interesting explanation. By faith, Sarah herself received Power, power to conceive. Remember, how does one cell become a fetus? That power, that's a divine power. How does cell divide and divide and divide and divide and becomes a human being and becomes Judah? Power. Sarah received the power to conceive even when she was part of uh, past, past the age, in other words, she was way beyond menopause, see, uh, since she conceived him faithful, consider him faithful who had promised. In other words, he believed in God. 
God is able and that God's going to do it. Okay? That's how he was, a, he was able to give birth to Isaac. Ishmael was born according to the nature, but Isaac against the nature. But super nature, supernatural means. That's Christian gospel, people. It's not your doing. It's not your little bit of good work here and there. Just think about it, how ridiculous that is. Whenever I share the gospel uh, at a boat that I go fishing, people always talk about something, uh, something good that they're doing. Oh, you know, I catch fish, I give to the uh, senior citizens. <laughs> they always talk about the few things they do well. So I always tell them, hey, John, you cannot negate one million wrongs with couple rights. You can't do that. God is perfectly righteous. Do you know what I mean? So it's man's wisdom, man's ways, man's scheme, and man's power, impatience. And Ishmael was born, uh, born and he's a slave. Okay? But Isaac, against the nature, against all hope, Romans chapter 4 says, but in hope, supernaturally and divinely, and power given by the Spirit, through the Spirit of God, if you are Christian, Spirit of God gave you birth. If Christ lives in you, Spirit of God lives in you. That's what we've been learning in Galatians Gospel up to this point. So in summary, Ishmael was born as a slave. Isaac was born as a child, okay, according to the promise. Everyone, every single one of you were born as a slave. Me too. But if you are born again, then you will live. Then you are Isaac. But the truth is, everyone is either Ishmael or Isaac. Everyone is slave, either a slave or a son. You know, we've been saying that. Biblical gospel truth is if you are born once, you will die twice. Absolutely the truth. That's going to be the case with your family members, your mother and father, your siblings, your children, every human being. Putin, Zelensky, Mr. Biden, doesn't matter. Every human being. Okay? However, if you are born twice and born again, you will die only once. That's the Christian gospel. Okay? Part two. The uh, Paul's uh, explanation or the argument through uh, allegory or uh, analogy starts from <clears throat> verse 24. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically or analogy. These women are two covenants. It's not very difficult. Stay with me. Hagar and Sarah represents two covenants, two testaments, Old Testament and New Testament. Basically, that's what it is, okay? One is from Mount Sinai. Through Moses, the law was given. Basically, law is about your responsibility. You love God and you love your neighbors, but we can't. So realize you can't do that and you will be a slave and you will be under the curse. That's the Old Testament, okay? So one is from Mount Sinai, being children for slavery, and she is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, so... Uh, you know Ishmael is the, uh, the progenitor of the old Arabs right now. It's kind of interesting if you look at the history. Through that idea of Sarah, this historical enemy, they're still fighting. Do you realize that? It's, it goes all the way back to Genesis. And this, here's the explanation. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, that religious establishment, uh, uh, establishment of Judaism and, and the Jews, religious people like you, like me, unless you are truly awakened by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? She is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above now, totally different category, talking about Isaac, Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, and that's, uh, and that's the allegory. And here is my uh, summary. I know you study like this. I love to put things like this together. 
And this is very uh, simple, and uh, it's going to clarify things, okay? Hagar and Sarah. Hagar was a slave, and Sarah was a free woman. Hagar, represent, uh, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, who was born according to the flesh, and he was a slave. Sarah gave to birth to Isaac, and she, he was birthed through God's promise, supernatural means, and the power of God. Third line. Uh, Hagar represents Sinaitic uh, uh, covenant of the law, Mount Sinai, which means the law and your responsibility, man's religion. You need to do this. You need to fulfill this. Whereas covenant of promise is through mountain Calvary, and God has done it, and God has done everything. Do you see the difference? And Hagar represents present Jerusalem, Judaism, that existing religious people. Whereas Sarah represents Jerusalem above, or heavenly Jerusalem, which represents the church and Christians, Isaacs. And last line, the children of present Jerusalem are the legalists, people who try to earn salvation, which still exist inside the church. Ishmael's. And then the children of Jerusalem above are true Christians birthed through the grace of God and the Spirit of God. Pretty, pretty clear, isn't it? It's not that difficult. I'll be able to share this with you. When this opens up, Galatian gospel kind of becomes clear. Okay? People say, oh, it's so difficult. It is based on Old Testament knowledge, which I don't have. I cannot understand. If I were you, I would go back to Genesis and read it so that you could understand what this is talking about. And it is not very difficult. Okay? Here's the diagram, and then you, know, you could pretty much understand it. Okay? So basically, if you want to understand the Bible, there are two Testaments, Old Testament and New Testament. One is law, and the other one is the gospel. Very simple. Stay with me. One is through Moses, the other one is through Christ. One is about your responsibility, and the other is about what God has done. You need to do this. You will do this. And the gospel is about, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You could either be a very, very religious person and live as a slave, or you could be truly rebirthed and live as a child of God. Can I just ask you, are you a child of God or are you a slave? Do you think you're Ishmael or Isaac? Oh, Pastor Paul, you're so, you're so mean. I'm not, actually. This is exactly what the scripture is asking you to think about. I know, intuitively, as we are reading through this, you're wondering, do I belong to this category or this category? Maybe one foot here, one foot there. <laughs> There's no such thing. There's no such thing, people. You may be in third or second uh, trimester pregnancy from embryo and ready to be birthed, which I believe there are a lot of people. Or you may have no life in you yet. Whatever the case may be, are you listening? Are you an Ishmael or are you an Isaac? Okay? So, let me go to the application part. I'm just going to skip. Okay? Third part. So how does that apply to me? Verse 28 now you, brothers, if you are in Christ, you're like Isaac. It's an amazing statement, people. How did Isaac ex exist? Isaac exists only because God promised and God said he would exist. How is it possible that 100-year-old man and 90-year-old woman give birth to a life? It's impossible naturally. It's impossible by, by human beings. Only possible by divine means, supernaturally. It's God's work. How could one cell become a fetus? It's the power of God, isn't it? So that's the application. You, like brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But listen to this. As a children of Isaac, there are two things you, you could expect. Number one, just as at the time he was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, 
persecuted him who was born according to spirit. That's Isaac. Ishmael was 14 years older than Isaac. Isaac, when he was three years old, in Genesis 21, he weaned. Okay, I guess he's a little grown-up boy now, around age three. Okay, we Koreans celebrate first birthday, but I guess Jews celebrate third birthday. So it was a very, very special occasion. And then there was Ishmael, who was 17 years old. So he was a teenager, right? And he basically looked at Isaac, and he, he basically hated him, right? That's what we see, persecuted him. So he says, just as Ishmael persecuted Isaac, so it is now. It is, it is true right now. Did you know that? Inside the church, there are a lot of Ishmaels. A lot of Ishmaels. People who never were birthed. Never were birthed. And they would always persecute Isaacs inside the church. They would hate the truth being preached because it offends them. Can I just share what John Stott says? John Stott, <clears throat> who's a uh, great expositor, recently passed away. Um, in his teaching of Galatians, he said, the greatest enemies of the evangelical faith today are not unbelievers, but who uh, sometimes they would receive the gospel, often, oftentimes they embrace it. The greatest enemy of the Christian faith are inside the church by the half-brothers, religious people, and nominal Christians who never was rebirthed. you look at me here? Some of you look tired. Are you rebirthed? Are you Ishmael? I'm serious. I'm asking this question. Are you Isaac? Oh, pastor, you, you don't love, you don't seem like you love us. Well, that's exactly why I'm sharing this, people. Are you Ishmael? Or are you Isaac? The greatest enemy of Christian faith is not just from the outside, but inside the church, John Stott is saying. And we could expect that. Okay? Always persecuting Isaacs. Truth bothers you. Remember I, I sh shared with, uh, with you last week? As I am being faithful to the scripture, it's going to bother you. It bothers the natural man because your heart is naturally rebellious against God. So the word of God will bother you until you truly turn and repent and submit to Him. Then you will begin to have peace in your heart. But until then, you cannot take it anymore. You have to leave or you have to pick up a stone and throw it at me. Just kill, just as you know, they killed Stephen, you're going to have to kill me. Look at him. Look at the way he's dressed. Look, he's gaining weight. You know, you, you, you're going to say all these ridiculous things to ridicule me because of the truth. As long as I'm fa being faithful to the gospel. Okay? The second thing, however, you could expect it is this. Verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. Wow. That was so mean, isn't it? Still Abraham's son. Ishmael is a little 17-year-old boy. And Hagar has no way to live. But they cast him out. It was actually Sarah's idea. Remember that? Sarah I said, I can't take, take them anymore. Let's just cast them out, which was really, really mean thing. So Abraham was bothered. So he goes to God, and he asked God, what should I do? And surprisingly, God said, do what Sarah says. Cast them out. So Abraham cast them out, Hagar and Ishmael. And God, was, God blessed them, so they became a nation. The whole Arabs, whole Arabs. But they are not the heirs of God. But they become a nation. You know what you have to do, uh, brothers and sisters? You're going to have to cast out. You're going to have to cast out Hagar and Ishmael out of your life. You've got to be stop being religious. You have to stop being religious people and being Ishmael. You're going to have to cast them out. You have to stop being a religious person. Really repenting and surrendering before the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
Have you done that? Okay. Have you done that? Until then, you're before, before faith. Okay. So it's kind of interesting tension, right? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of slave, but of free women. Here's the factual reality. You as a Christian, you're always going to have a persecution from the world, persecution from Ishmael, but you are going to be the child of God and you have the blessing of God. That's the tension. I wish everything is peace, 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 but it doesn't work like that because we are in the enemy territory, remember? We do not belong in this world. We are citizens and ambassadors of the Jerusalem above. Kingdom citizens. Can I just ask you? If you are kingdom citizens and uh, you represent that kingdom, would you say amen? I'm going to ask you to say it again confidently. Not proudly. I mean, in a pride sense. But confidently. If you represent Jerusalem above because your faith and life is in Christ and Christ alone. Would you say amen? amen. Would you be willing to be uh, claim that at a wedding? At a parties? At work? Do you do that? Brothers and sisters, or do you work, do you just kind of act a little differently? Can you imagine my children you know, I've done that when I was young. Really embarrassed the fact that I'm their father. Can you imagine that? In front of your friends. In front of your coworkers. Can you imagine that? Can you be confident that you represent the greatest kingdom? You know, I shared this on Friday, and I want to share this again. We are not the underdogs, people. We may be few, but we represent the greatest kingdom, the King of kings and Lord of lords. If you agree with me, would you say amen? amen. I, I pray that you do. I pray that you will not be ashamed. Remember, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, when the Son of Man returns, I'll be ashamed of you. That's not just a threat. If you really meet Christ, if you're really being birthed as Isaac, you will be so confident and proud of being Isaac. Amen. I want to just close uh, with just a couple of thoughts. Uh, we're finishing up this Galatian gospel section, and it was repetitious. It was everything was about salvation by grace. How many of you began to understand grace in a deeper way? Friday night, we had uh, Galatians group had, had a gathering. We have extravagant amount of food. And after, the, uh, after dinner, we sat around and basically we talked about what are you learning as we go through the book of Galatians. And there are great, great, great sharings. One of them said, I always knew grace was important, but I didn't know grace was that important. I think that's an amazing statement. Someone shared, the gospel of Jesus Christ must be pure, otherwise it is not the gospel. Someone else shared, gospel of Christ is bigger than history, certainly bigger than my life. Okay, you could hear that, right? Brothers and sisters, we're finishing up chapter 4, and I'm asking you, who is your mother? That's the real question. Is your mother Hagar? Is your mother Sarah? Are you doing religious religion with Christianity? Just kind of put your feet in the church once in a while, perhaps enough, minimally? That is not Christianity, people. Christianity is about lordship of Jesus Christ, kingship of Jesus Christ, being so proud of the fact that I am a child of God. 
and, and, and be able to proclaim to people, not as an underdog. We are an underdog as in, in terms of number, perhaps, but not in terms of the kingdom. We are not underdogs. We, are, we represent the greatest kingdom, and the message that we deliver to people is not begging them, but we are proclaiming it to them because they should be the one who needs to, uh, who needs to repent and beg to Christ for salvation. Okay. We cannot help but to be persecuted by the world and Ishmael's, but we are the heirs of God. And it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, if you are children of God, then you are heirs of God. We sang it today. I don't know how many of you appreciated that. We sang it today. We sang it today. I don't know how many of you appreciate what we are singing Heirs of God and co-heir with Christ. And lastly, we are citizens of the Jerusalem above and live like one people. It's not about you gaining more things and toys in this world. It never meant to be like that. For so many years, church has been teaching, false teachers has been teaching. It is about if you put your faith in Christ, you will do well in this world. That's a lie. That's poison. That's the completely opposite of what the gospel is saying. We belong to Jerusalem above, and we are citizens and ambassadors of that kingdom. I think that's, that's the summary of, you know, chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Galatians' gospel. And I pray that the Lord will clarify who is your mother and who you are okay, through this gospel of Galatians. Let's pray.